Good morning and welcome to Christ Community, our worship service live here online. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're sensing the presence of the Lord and uh, know that God is on our side. And though we are trucking through this wilderness of a crisis, God will lead us through and there is hope. So proud to see all of you, all of you watching. Just glad that you have been able to connect uh, as we come in. Why don't you just take a moment uh, right there in the YouTube feed and would you greet somebody, uh, call somebody by name, even if you don't know them, say, hey, look, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well. You know, speak a blessing, uh, speak words of encouragement. Maybe it's somebody you connected during the prayer during the week. Just take a moment and do that. Just kind of celebrate somebody. And that, that's what it's going to take because we're still community, even online. We may not physically be together, but we are digitally together and we want to continue the reverberation of that spirit amongst one another. And so I hope you feel a little bit greeted uh, online there with each other. So glad to see you all today. Just a couple of things very quickly. Uh, before we get into today's word, I believe God has a word for us that's going to really bless us. Uh, number one, just, just want to remind you that um, we're going to continue with care. That's a big C. We're going to continue with care as a church. And so our goal is that we want to contact every single member. I've had a chance to talk to many of you and just want to encourage you, just want to make sure you're doing well. And so our care teams and a number of our uh, people uh, that are in the, the congregational care system are reaching out to touch touch base with you and just want to make sure you're okay, make sure they're, they're, uh, your needs are taken care of. Maybe there's some immediate needs that we might be missing that we want to minister to. Uh, if there's a need that we've missed, uh, please email us at admin at ccrichardson.org. That's going to be the main email. Uh, let us know. We surely want to minister to our people. Also, too, I just want to remind everyone, uh, we know this is a stressful time, and actually I'm going to deal with emotions today in today's message. If you need to talk to someone, uh, spiritual and professional, don't forget Reverend Jada Jackson is still available and can help us and talk to us during these very stressful times. Uh, you have not sinned because you talk to someone God has equipped to deal with mental and emotional matters. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Her email is jjackson at ccrichardson.org. And so she is available as well. And, and we surely want to make sure that during these very stressful times, uh, those of you who definitely feel like you need to reach out and talk to somebody, and that's very helpful, uh, reach out to Reverend Jackson. She will bless you. Also, too, uh, just to make sure uh, you've downloaded your app and updated your account information. Again, you should have received a number of emails and texts from us. If you're not receiving it, make sure you download the church app and you can do that by texting CC Richardson app to 77977. You'll get the app. That'll get you connected with all of the information updates. Uh, we'll get your email right. Email us at admin at ccrichardson.com. If you're not receiving the updates, we're sending you things weekly. Pastors sending you updates just to keep you connected with community. As I said before, it's extremely critical at this time to remain connected as much as possible. I am concerned that we can't physically be together, but God is able. But at a minimum, we've got to be digitally together. And that's very, very important. Lastly, and surely not least, I just want to remind you that I want to encourage you to keep up with your giving. I thank you so much for the giving that you've already done up to this point. Uh, we surely want to continue to be a ministry as we minister in our community, as we minister and support our missionaries and all the work that we have in Dallas, as well as abroad, uh, as well as the ministry we give to you. And so we want to continue with that. And, and we surely want to be a light in darkness with the king, uh, with the kingdom. And, and, and also, too, in terms of our faith in God, let's always remember uh, God is the one 
who provides for us. And our giving is a reminder of who owns it all. And so that's our way of honoring him, uh, particularly in a culture of hoarding. Let's remember that and just want to encourage you with that. You can do all that online at our website, through the app, uh, through our Push Pay pay app. Uh, We surely want to encourage you with that. Lastly and not leastly, sure, just want to make sure you know the discussion questions are in the link below. Uh, this YouTube picture. So get those discussion questions, get the handout so you can follow along the message and get all the notes and and be able to hear what God is saying to you and kind of take that home and process it and work it out uh, with other individuals. God bless you. I'm so proud of you. You're keeping your faith up. Uh, God's going to reward us immensely because we're trusting him in a crisis. You can bet there's a blessing around the corner. God bless you. nobody but you in this season that's pulling us through God every trial every hardship every fear that wasn't given to us by you Lord you have not given us a spirit of fear Lord it was you every step of the way pulling us through God oh God it was you Lord pulling us through Lord through all I have gone through Lord, it was you, yeah. Through all I have gone through, Lord, it was you, yeah. It was you, it was you pulling me through. God, we bless your name, bless your name. It was you, Lord, it was you, pulling me through, oh, through all, through all, I've gone through, Lord, it was you, Lord, it was you, yes, through all, I've gone through, Lord, it was you, Lord, it was you. But it was you, Lord, every time. It was you. Lord, it was you. Lord, it was you. Pulling me through. Pulling me through. Oh, through all. Through all. I, I have gone through. Lord, it was you. Lord, it was you. Every time, every time, every time.
Father, we bless you again for this day that you have made. We acknowledge you as the creator of all things. And so bless us with your presence. Speak to our hearts. We need a word from you as always. I believe you have a word for us today in this most turbulent time. You're still God and you will preserve us. We thank you in advance for what you shall do in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want to kind of continue on this theme of standing firm in a coronavirus crisis and, and kind of help us speak to it, uh, kind of still deals with our series of total life change, but, but really it shows us how God deals with us in crises like this. Uh, we're going to continue our study looking at the nation of Israel uh, during their 40-year wandering in the wilderness and even though it was a difficult place, that place was the place that God affected a lot of life change in the lives of his people. And I believe the same thing is actually happening with us in this coronavirus crisis, that God can use it to develop us. And what was meant to destroy us, God can turn around and use it to develop us. And so that's going to be our goal. And so today, I want to invite your attention to Exodus chapter 17. 
verses 5 through 7. I want to encourage you to read all of chapter 17, especially verses 1 through 7. But for the sake of our time and for the purpose of our message, I'm just going to look at verses 5 through 7. And listen to what it says. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. And behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. And you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? And so I want to talk about why our emotions get the best of us, why our emotions get the best of us. Right now on the screen, you should be seeing a picture of a Star Trek character by the name of Data. Data. I'm kind of a Trekkie. I, I'm, I'm kind of a sci-fi kind of guy. I like sci-fi movies. I like sci-fi TV episodes. And if you've never heard of Data, you, you've sinned and we're praying for you. But anyway, I'm kind of that kind of individual. And this character to me is very interesting. Data is an android. Uh, he's not a human being. He has the appearance of a human being on the outside, but he's a machine. He's an android. Uh, he, he doesn't understand laughter. He, he can't feel. He has no emotion. Uh, he really doesn't have any personality. He's very mechanical. Uh, but yet he's one of the main characters in the Star Trek franchise. What's interesting, though, his software desperately wants to be human. He wants to experience human emotions, even though he's a machine, even though he is an android. Uh, on one occasion, he was given that opportunity. He was given what, was, what is called an emotion chip. And this emotion chip was, was inserted into his computed circuitry in which he was allowed to experience human emotions. And so for the first time in Data's existence, he experiences love. He experiences joy. He experiences happiness. He really is able to engage true laughter and even a sense of humor. But then one day, Data finds himself in a life or death situation in a battle. And in that moment, for the first time, he experiences fear. He experiences despair. And without thinking, he completely melts down in the moment. He's ineffective. He shuts down and he, he checks out of the situation. And so his captain, Captain Picard, turns to him and realizes that Data has shut down in this battle, this life and death situation. And he says, Data, you're a machine. Just turn off your emotions. And Data pauses for a second and he, he kind of uh, twitches his neck. And within that moment, he turns off his emotions. No more fear, no more despair, no more anxiety. And he's able to fight the battle. I believe I am feeling anxiety. It is an intriguing sensation. A most distracting. Yeah, I'm sure it's a fascinating experience, but perhaps you should deactivate your emotion chip for now. Good idea, sir. Done. Data, there are times that I envy you. And as I thought about that, I said, I said to myself, wouldn't that be nice that in the midst of trial and anxiety, in the midst of trauma, in the midst of this crisis, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to switch off our emotions when trouble comes and when difficulty comes, just as we're experiencing in this crisis, wouldn't it be great to flip a switch and says, you know what? I'm not going to experience depression today. I'm not going to experience anxiety today. And when the good motions come, you know what? I'm going to flip the switch on and I want to experience love. I want to experience joy. And the truth is life doesn't work that way. And the truth is also some of us know some datas. They've experienced so much hurt and damage. They've figured out how to shut their emotions down. And because they're data android-like individuals, they do more harm to themselves, they do harm to their own health, and they even do harm to their loved ones. And so most of us realize that's impractical. That's not even what God would expect of us. And so we kind of reject this data reality, but by rejecting it, 
that still opens the door that our emotions get the best of us. And it really raised the question, look, I don't want to be a data. I don't want to be a machine. I don't want to be an android. But how do I live in a stressful situation in a way in which my emotions don't get the, don't get the best of me? I don't want to live in denial like data. I don't want to shut down. But at the same time, even when I try to engage and be a normal individual, my emotions can overwhelm me? It's a great question. How do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you handle the stress of this new normal? We'll probably be here for a while, not trying to be pessimistic. I know God can bring us through and we can have faith in the midst of the difficulty, but how do we deal with the ongoing stress? Parents, how do you handle the fact that you got to work at home and deal with your kids now? That's a lot of stress. That's a lot of, that's a lot of household stress right now, a lot of energy, a lot of emotion. How do you handle all that? How do you deal with the uncertainty and the unpredictability uh, over the fact that our collective future is so unsettling? And that's really what's driving the stress because the truth is we don't know where this thing is going to land in the next month or two or three months. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with a, with a future that has no end when we're structured to have that kind of path and direction that helps us through life? And that's kind of what's going on in this text that I just read to you. Uh, surely the people of God in this text that we just read, they were not in a coronavirus crisis, but they were in a wilderness crisis. And, 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 and it's really a, a, an episode in which, once again, the Israelites are in the wilderness and they complain and grumble and quarrel against God. Why? Because they're having a meltdown. Their emotions are getting the best of them. They can't handle the crisis. They can't handle the stress. And God takes them to the wilderness because he's trying to teach them one simple lesson that I pray and hope you get today. And that is this. Whenever your emotions are telling you one thing, that's the time to embrace your faith and trust God to do something different. In other words, there are going to be times when our emotions are going to even speak with a sense of feeling that's logical. But then we've got to have the faith to recognize that no matter what my emotional situation may say, God is able to do something to the contrary. And so put it another way, when my emotions begin to bark like a dog out of control, I've got to let my faith become a leash that puts control on the dog to say, sit down somewhere. God's going to do something on the other side. That's the time when faith has to step in, church. And we've got to trust God to believe that no matter how bad the situation is, no matter what our emotional temperature may say, God can bring a calm when we place faith in him. And so I can already tell those who are watching, you may not be feeling me yet. And so let me see if I can help you feel this a little bit. Have you ever been in a place or a space in which your mind was saying one thing, but your body was saying something else? Don't say amen because you don't want to say amen in front of the, right, the, uh, the wrong people right now. You may want to keep that to yourself. But anyway, maybe your mind one time was telling you, you know what? You ought, to, you ought not have another slice of that sake to me cake. But your body was saying, go ahead and get three or four more slices. And common sense stepped in and said, look, I know it looks good and smells good, but right now I need to follow my right mind. And that's what it means to walk in faith over my emotions. Sometimes my emotions may scream objection, but I've got to have the faith to say faith overrules my emotional objection because God has something for me on the other side. That's what we learn in this story, and that's what God is trying to teach us. We've got to have faith when our emotions are screaming something else. They may be saying one thing, but let's trust God for something new. Weeping may endure for a night. That's emotions. But joy comes in the morning. That's faith. Young men may utterly fall. Youths may faint. Young men may utterly fall. That's emotion. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That's faith. They shall mount up with wings like eagle. eagles. They will run. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faith. And so what does that look like? How do, how do I get a handle of that? What is God doing? How, how do I keep my emotions from getting the best of me? Number one, let me give you four very quickly. Number one, embrace new rhythms. 
embrace new rhythms. I'm going to say that again. You got to embrace new rhythms. This is a transition. And the old rhythms are gone. Trust me, as a preacher, I'm used to preaching to a large crowd. And, and I'm even struggling with this shift that now I got to preach into a camera. But let me tell you something. If me, this shy, introverted preacher, can preach into a camera and, and adjust to the new rhythm, trust me, you also can adjust to the new rhythms that God has for your life. Let go of the old rhythms and let God give you some new rhythms. That's what the struggle here is in the text is Israel was struggling with this shift. Because in verse 1, the text says that then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages in the wilderness. God was leading them. To journey by stages was simply another way of saying they broke camp and then they made camp. From day to day, they broke camp and made camp. They broke camp and made camp. Now, that may not mean much to us, but imagine everything you have and everything you own in your home, in your apartment, wherever you live. All your shoes, all your clothing, all your, all your belongings. Imagine every day you had to pack all that stuff up, and then you got to unpack all that stuff. And then the next day you got to pack all that stuff up again, and then you got to unpack all that stuff. And, and in that, that's what Israel was going. And I don't know about you, I, I, I hate moving. I hate moving just one time. I can't imagine doing that every single day. But that's what Israel was going through every single day. They had to pack up all their belongings and then turn around and unpack all of their belongings because God was trying to break some old rhythms and at the same time instill some new rhythms. He was trying to break them out of some old patterns in order to build some new patterns in their life. And so this, this time, this, this crisis, don't, don't look at it as all bad. God can take a bad situation and bring something good at it. That's, that's the cross. That's the, that's the gospel. He can take a dark Friday and turn it into a resurrection Sunday morning. He can take the worst situation and turn it around. So also with the crises, the very thing that was meant to destroy me, he can use it to bless me. And many times the blessing is a little bit uncomfortable. He's breaking rhythms. And so old rhythms that God is trying to break. For many of us, this is a shift in that no longer should we treat our faith like a driver's license in our wallet or in our pocketbook that we pull out in time of trouble. But God says, no, I want a new rhythm. I want you to treat it like an investment, something you check on every single day. I want this to be a way of life for you. I don't want it to be something you pull out in trouble or in a time of stress. I want it to be a new experience for you. God breaking up old rhythms, giving us new rhythms. Some of us, it's a, it's a breaking of the old rhythm of a solo faith. You know, we kind of would come to church on Sunday morning from time to time, get a word, boom, bounce, we're gone. And we really don't have any engagement with the rest of God's people in terms of discipleship and spiritual growth or evangelism or ministry or the fact that God may have a call upon our life. And so maybe God is breaking the old rhythm of this solo Christianity and wants us to move into a community rhythm. Or here's one, maybe God is breaking the rhythm, the old rhythms of hoarding. I think it was Jim Carrey, and it should be on your slide. He said it like this, I wish that everyone could be rich and famous and have everything they ever dreamed of so that they would know that's not the answer. Isn't that something? And I think we live in that kind of culture, that if I have enough money, if I have enough fame, that's what's going to fulfill me. That's why we're seeing all this mass hoarding. You, you go to the grocery store in the afternoons, the shelves are completely empty and people are not even thinking about other individuals. They're just thinking about themselves and what they don't recognize. If we don't start thinking about each other, we're not going to get through this together. And so the principle here is that in a culture of hoarding, we ought to still maintain or even adopt a principle or a rhythm of giving. Yeah, I said it. I know that's a little bit different, 
But giving is intrinsic to who I am as a follower of Jesus. God gives to us. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. God gives to us every day. Everything we have comes from a gracious God. And so, therefore, with my giving, whether it is to my church, whether it is an offering, or whether it is to people, to people in need or ministry, or however it is, I'm demonstrating the very character of God. And so, let God leads you to embrace new rhythms. Number two, if I'm going to deal with emotions that get the best of me, I've got to embrace the emotional moment. i got to ride this thing out. Because in this text, if you look at it, it's kind of a deja vu experience. The Israelites come into this place called Rephidim, and they camp at this place, and they're out of water, and once again, they're, they're angry, and they're, they're, they're angry, and they're upset that there's no more water. And they begin to argue and they begin to quarrel. And this thing kind of escalates. And the same thing that happened in Exodus 15, verses 20 through to 25, in which they got upset because there was no water. The same thing is happening here. It's a deja vu moment. And what God was teaching them that in these moments, you've got to embrace it. You've got to, here it is, you've got to ride it out. Don't, don't hold on to it as if somehow that's the only place to be, but you got to ride it out like a roller coaster. And that's how life is emotionally. Again, I'm not saying that you don't talk to professional people that can help you with mental or emotional uh, health care and all that kind of stuff, but, but that's how life is. You're going to have some hills and some valleys, and you're going to have some smooth sailing. But the only way to get to the smooth highway, you've got to ride out those hills, and you've got to ride out those valleys. And so when we find ourselves in the emotional wilderness, we've got to embrace The emotional moment, we've got to embrace it. Put another way, accept all emotions, whether positive or negative. Embrace it. Ride it out. That's how you get through grief. You don't ignore it. You don't deny it. You don't act like it didn't happen. You don't don't mention it as if somehow it, it never happened. No, you embrace it for the moment. And then you just keep moving. And in time, you'll get better and get better. Doesn't mean you'll get back to normal. You'll have a completely different normal, but you will get better. Some of you, when you get overstressed and you you kind of feel like you can't go on, just go into your little private closet and just, just have a cry. Get it out of your system. Some of us, we may not remember, but not too long ago when we were younger, we know that folk, uh, our friends, because we would never do this ourselves, when they had a little bit too much to drink, they would vomit all that stuff out of us, out of themselves. (laughs) And so some of you, maybe it's just an emotional vomiting and and maybe you you need to just get some stuff out of your system. But as you accept this, this experience and you accept the emotional moment, you're able to get it out of your system. Somebody said it well, says we know that emotions are contagious just like a virus. What we also know is that negative emotions, fear, anxiety, helplessness, panic, are far more contagious than positive emotions like hope and love and compassion and excitement and gratitude. Isn't that real? Isn't that how life happens sometimes? That many times you can be around negative people and you take on their tendencies so easily. But then when you're around a positive environment, you really got to be intentional about that. You got to be intentional to be positive. So I want to encourage you, accept all emotions, uh, whether positive or negative, embrace that and and beware of what you're taking in. There's some stuff in the media, it'll make you vomit, whether it's the false news or the bad news, too much of CNN or too much of Fox News or too much of MSNBC, too much of all this bad news in New York Times and all these different news reports. It can make us sick and we got to get it out of our system. And so we got to embrace the emotional moment. Number three, we got to embrace... The examples that God gives us. Embrace the examples that God gives us. And so the Lord tells Moses, he said, look, I know these people are upset with me. I know they're angry. They're quarreling. They're ready to to execute me. And so I'm going to give you some instructions. I want you to pass by before the people, and I want you to bring them to this place, this rock at Horeb, and there I will stand, and you will strike the rock. It's interesting that he takes him to the place called Horeb. And if you know a little bit about Moses' background, you'll remember that Horeb was the place 
that, that Moses met God. It was in Exodus chapter 3 that Moses had a burning bush experience. And that burning bush took place on horror. Because God was using Moses, watch this, to bring the people to the same place that God had brought Moses to. And many times we forget that even in this text, as the people struggle with their own emotions, Moses himself struggled with his emotions. Moses had an anger problem. Matter of fact, chapter 2 tells the story that when he sensed that he was the called deliverer for Israel, he got so angry with an Egyptian and he lost his anger and he killed the Egyptian. And for 40 years, God sentenced him on the backside of a wilderness. Matter of fact, at the enclosure of the 40 years in the wilderness, the Bible says that God told him, came to a similar incident just like this one. And God told him, he said, look, I'm going to provide people with the water from a rock. But this time, I don't want you to strike the rock. I want you to speak, the, speak to the rock. And Moses lost his temper. And instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock twice. And God in his grace allowed water to flow from that rock to, to satisfy the thirst of the people. But Moses was prevented from going into the land. Moses had an anger problem. And, and God was using him as an example before the people. If I can bring Moses through this to this place, would you trust me to bring you through? And I think that's how life works. God puts examples in our lives. God gives us individuals that many times they've come through what we're trying to come through. That's what the faith is all about. That's why you need community. That's why you need family. That's why you need other brothers and sisters in Christ, because there's some things that God has done in their life that will surprise you that they came through it that will help you in the same thing you're trying to come through. There are individuals that were, are in far worse financial condition than you are, but God brought them through it. And if you were in relationship with them, guess what? You probably can learn the lessons that kept them uh, from sinking in and coming through it. And so these are the times when we have to embrace those examples. And God always provides us, whether in history or in our communities or in our families, those Moses examples who've been to places that we also are trying to come through. And so here I'm thinking of Moses' mother, Jochebed. And Jochebed, when Moses was born, was under a ruthless pharaoh who who wrote a law that basically said any newborn Hebrew child is to be thrown into the Nile, murdered. And when Moses was born, he was born under that same oppressive regime. But Jochebed took one look at Moses and said, no, there's something special about this child. And what does she do? She, she takes Moses and, and, and she, she finds some reeds from the Nile River and she builds a wicker, a, wicked ba a wicker basket, the Bible says. And she places Moses in that basket and puts him in the Nile and sets him off. And the rest is history. And I guess from a modern perspective, we're asking the question, what kind of mother does that? It's almost like leaving her child on the front doorstep of somebody, not knowing what's going to happen to that child. Where did she get the idea to just leave a child in a wicker basket in the Nile where there's crocodiles and all kinds of dangers and ways where that child could drown? What was Jochebed thinking? I'll tell you what she was doing. She was following the example of her, her ancestors. Because that word basket is the same Hebrew word that is used for the word ark, A-R-K. And that word ark is the same word that was used of Noah's ark. When God told Noah, I need you to build an ark, and his family went into that ark, and God preserved him through a 40-year flood, and Jochebed somehow got the revelation of the witness or the reminder of what her ancestor had done and said to herself, well, if God can keep and save Noah in his ark, maybe if I put Moses in an ark, God will do the same for him. And that's exactly what God did. And here's the word. We all have have an ark that we can share with somebody. And so if I can just think of one person, I'm thinking of my grandparents and my grandmother and the ark that she gave to my mother and the ark that she gave to my dad and passed on to me was the ark of education. She passed on the ark of excellence. She passed on the ark of hard work. 
She passed on the ark of dignity. In other words, no matter what you're in and no matter what difficulty you're in, you still can hold up your head. You still can have dignity. But she didn't just stop right there. My grandmother passed on the ark of faith. She made sure that we were going to go to church every Sunday. She made sure to remind us that we didn't get this far without a God watching over us. And all I'm simply trying to say, God has given you some arks. Don't Don't forget the folk who helped you get here. Share the arcs in your life as examples of what God can do for for your life and for somebody else. We didn't make it on our own. God was watching over us. And the same thing he did in the past, he'll do for us even in our right now. Embrace your examples. Embrace your arcs. And so number one, you got to embrace the new rhythms. Number two, you got to embrace the emotional moment. Number three, you got to embrace your examples that God gives you to follow through. But here's the last one. Number four, you got to embrace the cross, even in the wilderness. Pastor Archie, have you forgotten that you're in the Old Testament? Yes, I'm in the Old Testament. I'm in our Exodus. But I'm trying to tell you the cross is in this passage. It's, It's right in this passage. Yes, it is. I'd like to take credit, but I take insight from this from Tim Keller, who pastors Redeemer Church in New York City. Look what it says, and he gives great insight on this. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out. And that's exactly what happened. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that this rock that Moses struck in the wilderness was Christ. But what is interesting is that if you read the the Hebrew and the grammatical structure, there's a sense that the Shekinah glory crowd tells Moses, I'm going to stand in front of that rock. And Moses, I want you to take the staff, the same staff that I brought judgment on Egypt, and I want you to strike the rock through the cloud. And so there's a sense that when Moses struck the rock, he was piercing the cloud. And when he pierced the cloud, wrath and judgment did not come out on the people, which it should have. But what came out was the grace of living water. And Jesus would be the fulfillment of that some 1,500 years later when when he would be hung on a cross. And when he was struck and nailed to a cross, water didn't flow from his body, but blood flowed from his body so that for all time we can have the victory in the cross. And so the cross gives us forgiveness. The cross gives us hope. The cross gives us healing. The cross gives us an anointing. The cross renews us on the inside. The cross gives us hope. The cross gives us a blessing. The cross gives us a vision for our future. God takes us back to the cross. Even in the wilderness. And that's how we deal with our emotions. We got to take it back to the cross. And God there gives us healing, restoration, hope, a sense of maturity, development, and even a witness and an example for others. What he's done for others and what he's done for me, he'll show sure enough do for you. Boy, I want to close with this. It's been a blessing sharing with you. I was running as I always do. It's, it's something I've done for years. I, I do it to keep my blood pressure down and keep my health good. And so every morning uh, after I get my time with God early in the morning before day, I want to get my running in. And I try to get about two and a half, three miles in, sometimes three and a half. I'm feeling good. Uh, I'll do that. And so I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. can't remember which day. It may have been Wednesday. I got out running and I looked at my phone before I went out and there was the prospect of rain. But I looked outside. I said, well, it hasn't started raining yet. I think I'm going to run out here and take a chance. And so I got out there and started running. And of course, it wasn't raining at all. I got my rhythm. I had my worship music going. I was doing all right. I was running in a rhythm. All of a sudden, I was about two and a half miles in. And it started to just trickle and rain just a little bit. And, and there was a shortcut that I could have taken home in order to avoid the rain. But I said to myself, I said, no, nah, 
I've come too far by faith. I am not about to cut this short. I don't know if I'm going to get another chance to run. I'm going to give a full sprint, and I'm going to run home the long way so I can get a full three miles and get this thing over. And so, y'all, you should have seen me. I put on my full sprint. I look like Jesse Owens as if I was running in the Olympics. And I mean, I'm running as hard as I could. And I wasn't going that fast. We all know that because I'm old. But I was running at least at my full pace. And while I was running, something happened. The rain started to come down. But as the rain was coming down, I began to feel a burst of wind to my back. And all of a sudden, as I was running, I was able to run faster and get home quicker and avoid the rain that should have drenched me. And in that moment, it dawned on me that in a storm, you're going to have some rain. In a crisis, you're going to have some difficulty. But the good news is, if you trust God, he has a way of giving you the wind to your back to help you through your difficulty so that your emotions don't get Get the best of you, but your faith overrules your difficulty. God bless you. Keep your faith in him. He's not finished. He's got a wind to our back. We shall get through this for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And so the question is, what is God saying to us right now? How do we deal with the fact that our emotions get the best of us? Well, sometimes, as I say, God puts us in these scenarios because it's a decision time. It's an opportunity to connect maybe with Christ. And, and maybe this stressful time and, and all that the emotions have done to bring you to this place, maybe this is your opportunity today to connect with Christ. The gospel is very simple. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. And the Bible teaches that if you believe that, he will save you. And so who knows, all that you're feeling emotionally with all the stress and the crisis, wherever you are in the world, maybe God's using this. Again, I don't believe God is bringing this on people because God loves the world, my Bible says. But maybe God is using it as an opportunity for people to call out, upon, call out onto him, to come to him, to give their lives to Christ. And so if you're listening today, if you're watching today, Maybe this message was just for you. Maybe the reason why you're feeling all this stress, this anxiety, maybe the reason why your emotions get the best of you is because you don't have faith. And God wants you to take a step of faith today and trust him. Trust Jesus Christ who died on the cross 2,000 years ago, rose from the dead for your sins that you might have eternal life, but also to who lives today that he will walk with you and give you life in this life. He'll walk with you. He'll lead you. He has a purpose for your life. You can develop a relationship with him. He'll give you a whole new life, a new way of living, that you may experience the abundant life that God has for you. Maybe this is your beginning. Maybe this is the purpose of the crisis, to bring you to a place of faith. And that's because a God loves you, a God who sits high, who made the world, he loves you so much that he wants to have relationship with you. So if that's you, I want to walk you through this invitational prayer. It's very simple. You just, you just acknowledge that you believe Christ died for your sins and, and that you want to accept him as your Lord and Savior and, and that you want to be that difference maker for him. And, and that's all it takes. And I want to lead you through that prayer. And so if you would, just, just bow your head right there before your, before your iPhone, before your iPad, and I want to lead you through this prayer. And I'll cue you in terms of when to pray and, and how you can receive Christ today. Father, I just thank you so much for those who are watching and, and those who are, who, are, who are listening online and, and just how your spirit has moved in this place to help us deal with our emotions. But somebody's here today, Lord, they need the, the calming effect of faith, the calming effect of your presence in their life. They need the calming effect of salvation. And I pray right now, Lord, by your spirit, you'd move somebody to accept Christ today. And so if that's you and you want Christ, simply repeat these words after me, this prayer, and just Pray this to the Lord as you repeat them. And as you pray them, and if you pray them sincerely, God will answer your prayer. It's that simple. If you, if you want to do that, simply repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died and rose for my sins. 
thank you for salvation and thank you for forgiveness. I accept you as my Savior and as my Lord to make a difference in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that for the very first time, we celebrate you as you've been brought into the family of God. God bless you. We're so proud of you. Would you just let us know that you've done that? Let us know. Simply email us at, at uh, admin at ccrichardson.org. Let us know that we can help you on your journey. God's doing something great in your life. I know this is the beginning of something great. And I'm so proud of you. God's got a plan for your life. God bless you. Pulling me through. Lord, I confess it's hard right now, God. Oh, God, it was you. Lord, it was you pulling me through. Can you confess to him and say it was you?